Really. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the December Design Chat Christmas Edition. Christmas Holiday Edition. It is. It's looking very festive out there today. I kind of wish you had. We had a camera we could point outside. We like. I mean, you can see a little. Kind of see. Astute yeah. viewers will see beautiful flakes of snow drifting. Oh, uh, it's it's a lovely day. I, I told Cole I was fighting the urge just to. My uh, my office in, my office at my house has a nice big window, and so mm. I can just watch the snow fall out the out the back <laughs> and drink some hot coffee or cider and just kind of enjoy the day while I'm working on dark. But I gotta come in and do this, which is I'm very 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 excited to be here and to be doing this today. So no problem. Yeah, um, yeah. how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, let's see what I do today. My it's now the season where car batteries fail, so I've been jumping my car. Everywhere I go, I have a little battery assist. It's just part of the ritual I have with my car, which is that I get out, and uh-huh. I jump it, and then I go to the next place. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be sorting through that. Uh, there was an episode of MASH where they um, lost a rotor on a rescue helicopter. and they uh, uh, not, rotor, not a rotor, uh, the fan belt. And they had to put the fan belt back on to get it to fly, and then they'd have to keep putting it back on. I was like, there's no way... You would take off with the possibility of a fan belt coming out, right? <laughs> and then it seems... and crashing two hundred yards later, yeah. and, then, and then doing it again. <laughs> so, but that's all right, Stevie. Uh, so, um, someone reminded me that I need to put Slayer Gauge on the UI, which is yep. I wrote that into Twitter because it was the only way I could take notes at dinner last night. Okay, uh, um, I'm gonna get you a little pad and paper. That sounds like <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. I got this one right here. Oh it's yeah, one of a kind. There you go. Um, no, I th- it was. I could have put it into Slack, but I thought it was funnier to put it onto Twitter. I saw someone commenting, I think it was Garrick, about small box root, wanting a small box version of root, and I was reminded of Heiko's root redraw, which can be found in the depths of BGG. I yeah. don't think it's complete. Twig. Twig, yeah, yeah. twig, and it is a small box redraw of root. It's pretty charming. Is it twig or leaf? I think it's twig. I think it's twig. Yeah. Twig is much cuter. I didn't know it was complete. I, I, don't, I don't think it's all... Access accessible. Sure. I don't, the deck, for instance, I don't think is complete, but like the board that I've done. All right. Um, well, Heiko, I want to play that if you're watching. So, what are we doing today? We well, are. Let's we'll yes. talk about games. Yeah, we were talking about games. Um, um, what have you been playing? You played a lot this weekend. I played a lot this weekend. I so there is a group of people who I see at BGG kind of every year, who I love to play games with and to talk with, and they're they're friends from all sorts of different parts of my life. And we didn't do BGG Con this year. Instead, we just met up in Indianapolis and had a very small, like, 12-person game convention. And I played maybe, like, 20 games in nice. the weekend. It was great. It was fabulous. I uh, played all kinds of stuff. Um, I played games ranging from lots of, like, fresh fish and some older uh, kind of crustier Euros. I played uh, The God's War, which is this giant... Huge oh, yeah. miniature that game, right? game. Uh, no, not that. Not Zargos. Oh, uh, no. Uh, it, it's it's by the first the company that did Cthulhu Wars, but it's very it's like Glorantha creation myth as dudes on a map game. Mm-hmm. It was wild. It was so old fashioned in some of its sensibilities, but it was really fun to play. Huh. Uh, and then what else? We played. Uh, Psy- I gave a Psycho Raiders happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I introduced that their house to Pit. And we played, we played a lot of Pit, which was <laughs> nice. good. I just couldn't believe these were people that I had known for many years, and I couldn't believe they hadn't played Pit, so we I, fixed that. Did they play with the kids? No, no, no. They, I think it'd scare them. Sure. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, mean, I, think, <laughs> I think you need, a, you need you, It's all about reach. As soon as their reach is a certain point. Oh, okay. Um, I can't remember what I got me for. That was maybe one of my like foundational games, and I think about it. Oh yeah, Pit's like a huge part of my, my yeah. upbringing. I like got it at a at a grocery store or a department store when they had department stores, and when I was a kid, and then I we just played the heck out of it. So yeah, it's an incredible game. I'm sure uh, my parents were like, "Stop bringing it up." Garrick, it, we of course played the Plenary Rules version of Fresh Fish, which I think is the only real version of Fresh Fish. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Cool as a reach of 10. Yeah, I, I, I have opinions about fresh fish and its additions and rural quirks. <laughs> um, so, oh, and I did. Uh, I did play Turncoats. I was going to write you a message about it. Uh, so I uh, purchased this game called Turncoats, which is um, it's uh, an embroidered bag, really, that unfolds into the map for Turncoats. And it was wonderful. I played it three times in a row. And wanted to play it more. And in fact, uh, several people at that show 
desperately wanted to buy it. And I said, I'm going to write the person who made it, mm-hmm. um, who's in chat over there, um, who wanted to buy it. And I was like, I'm going to write the, the, the author of this game a message because I don't know how much publicity they might want me to offer their game. Mm-hmm. But it was wonderful. Um, I think it fell in the wor- one of the people I played it with compared it uh, to like a weird mixture of Premier and Paris Connection in terms of like how the game treats deduction. It's fabulous. Really good. I was very, very happy to, to to have it with me to play. So, great work. Do you still say Turncoat with The Revolution or World War II? I think The Revolution. Yeah. Because I always think about, like, I think I learned that word in the context of Benedict Arnold. Sure, sure. But like I don't... betrayed the revolution. Yeah, but I don't actually know... I mean, it could have been before then, right? Or, or after. Sure, right? yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, sure. And then we just started using that term. That's interesting. I associate it with the revolution too. Yeah, I will. I will have to bring it in so I can show it to Patrick because I think it's a beautiful. It's a beautiful design. Very well, and I love the production too. But it's it's fabulous. Um, I played a the saddest game of Warcry. That's pretty okay. Cool. <laughs> I played. I played by myself. I played two handed by myself. It was actually a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, it took me like a long time to get the first turn, and then once I got in the rhythm, of it, it was like the rest of the game was. The rest of the game was probably almost as long as the first turn. And you don't even have all your pieces on the board on the first turn. You don't, mm-hmm. your, a third oh, of your group doesn't arrive until the third turn. <clears throat> and uh, and then I played a game, uh, Carl Frost, who's like a content creator in Minneapolis, came over on Friday night and we played a uh, full game. Um, and I think it's just a little bit, maybe it's my age, but I think it's just a little bit more information you want to parse for both sides. And so, so having being playing it, playing it back to back like that, and then seeing it played, me playing one handed, I performed much better in the second game. Um, in fact, I, sorry, Kyle, I almost tabled Kyle during a game that didn't involve tabling. So uh, it, it happens. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, uh, I've been playing that. Uh, my wife and I have been playing um, the Pandasaurus game. Is it called That Time You Killed Me? Oh, yeah, I'm very interested in that. Yeah, uh, and so we got to the first box, um, which I won't spoil. Um, it's, I think the it's not really a legacy game in the sense that, like, you're changing the game. Mm-hmm. I think it's just a way to introduce you to some abstract pieces and concepts at a, at a pace where I don't throw all the pieces at you at once. Yeah, this is like a little bit how mind management works. Yeah. Right, yep. where it's like there are these modules that get activated depending on how much you've played the game. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so imagine if I was teaching you chess and I was like, here are the pawns and the queen. Right, and we will, yeah. Yeah, and then we'll add, we'll add pieces later. And that's enough to get a mate and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and play the game. I think it's, I mean, one thing that I feel like I'm seeing a lot of, and I think our are doing this too, is for folks who really like titles that get well supported mm-hmm. they run into this problem of like well how can i even play this game that i love because i own you know like if you add the carcassonne big box mm-hmm. five or whatever number they're on yeah how do you play carcassonne like i i know how i play carcassonne which is i usually just play cark with the river in it and that's it mm. um not, not with ends and cathedrals not with ends and cathedrals i think it's, it's cathedrals is fine but i usually are de- my, my default is just to, to play the yeah. vanilla cark and I think what you're starting to see folks in the design space and even in the publishing space say, what if we make sure there's a way to tour the game within the right, game? Right, right. Um, I'm, good. I'm expecting Batman, the animated series, mm-hmm. any day. And that was my mistake with Turtles, was I opened the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I'm literally going to bring home one box and hide the rest of my office. And just slowly. And then, and then and play that and then get used to it and then, and then jump up to the next. Yeah. We do, when we play the Arkham card game, um, we only use the investigator cards when we enter the new campaign right so we have all that we have not all of it but we have a lot of it and we could be building investigators using cards from almost every expansion right but instead we like say i mean it's like playing um android and uh, it's like playing netrunner and saying like we're just going to use the first two data cycles yeah because it's just too much information otherwise and it can get overwhelming i mean even the even android as a tournament did that right like they started saying they were only going to have the first six um the first six. Oh yeah, I picked up Final Girl. Uh, I played that. Um, I also have been getting back to the initiative with my spouse. Um, she and I have been playing Detroit Become Human. Mm. Uh, she played through it, and now she wants. It's really weird. She was like, "Not weird. She's fine." 
she was like, I want you to play it in mm. front of me so I can see the decisions you're making. Interesting. Because when we played Heavy Rain, which is our previous title, we, we made almost the exact same decisions all the way through the game. Mm-hmm. And so now she's... But we have diverged in our Detroit play, and so now she wants to watch Detroit, me playing Detroit. So that is, so I'm watching the action button review of Cyberpunk 2077. Sure, yeah. Which is incredible. Uh, it's taking me many days to watch this review. I think it's like an eight-hour review. You're supposed to watch three or four hours of it. It's like non-linear video review. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I've been watching almost like television. Like, you know, I'll be like, all right, let's queue up the, the next episode. Yeah. Um, and it, it uh, he, uh, the, the reviewer, Tim Rogers, does this really exhaustive um, survey of cyberpunk games. Didn't mention Detroit, though. I, I, I think Detroit might be the best adept. Like, it is very much about that story. Yeah. It is very much about the story of, like, if cyberpunk, if the th- core theme of cyberpunk is technology is dehumanizing. And you're kind of approaching it the other way and mm-hmm. saying, here is a group of people that have been completely dehumanized and stripped of all rights. What can they have? Mm-hmm. Um, boy. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a very, yeah, interesting. Yeah, you should. If, yeah, it's I, not just an adventure story in a cyberpunk universe. It's mm-hmm. not, there really isn't any adventure to it, but interesting. I'm going to write down Tim Rogers. Well, I don't, I mean, so I'm going to ask, uh, answer a question from the chat. Do you have time to watch an eight-hour review? I'll say, I think it's only about four because of how the review is structured. And I just break it up. Like, I, I, I listen to, you know, the second half of one of the parts while I ate breakfast this morning. Um, Cole doesn't sleep is what I learned also. He's, I get He sleeps I, yeah. less than us, us humans. I, I like a good six to seven-hour block. Yeah, I, I, I about very, seven. I'm very comfortable with that. Um uh, so I've been playing that, um, and then i um, been playing uh, Cursed, um, Warm Request, Cursed City, which is kind of just... Yeah, are you like in a campaign? Yeah, yeah. It, it's not... Um, I'm learning a lot for Castle Blood, and I mm-hmm. went back to work. My, my night shift is Castle Blood right now, and because um, um, it's like, here's things to avoid. <laughs> I'm gonna put it politely. That's a very no. That's a very positive way of of doing that. Yeah. That, that kind of so work, right? I have not. You don't have to show me dissent though, because I think there are some ideas that um, I'm kind of struggling with right now. The the system is firing very well, mm-hmm. but what I'm interested in figuring out now is like what does each encounter? What how much content is that supposed to deliver to the mm-hmm. player? And is the whole dungeon the encounter, which is how I'm thinking about it, like, when I designed it. And that may not, like, the act of entering a room in a and d game is, like, a very discreet moment. And mm-hmm. you are not having that experience in Castle Blood, and is that okay? Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know if I can answer that question, because I'm so close to the design. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the rest of it, the mechanics, the, ha- the hazards, the, the combat, it's starting to really come to gel for me. And so yeah, I'm that's an interesting question that. about, like, the pacing. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, I think... When I think about Descent, it is too choppy. Where, mm-hmm. like, you sort of have... I mean, it, it's almost as choppy as, like, Hero Quest is, where it's like you open a door. For as different as those two titles are. Sure. You open oh, the door, right. here's some stuff, deal with it. And yeah. rarely are you, like, reckoning with the map. Right. Which is funny for how produced the map is. Right. But rarely are you, like, thinking about beyond, like, the immediate grid. I mean, I even let my daughter just move to the next door. Yeah, of yeah, course. Freely. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, because, because there, there's no reason all that, the interstitial space doesn't matter. You just fly to this place yeah. you're supposed to go. Um, but it's weird to think about, I'm thinking about other games where, like, you know, in Diablo, mm-hmm. the room is is nothing. Right. It's like it's a very seamless or you know Hades it is like you know you're in those set pieces yeah. which are kind of like a couple rooms in a little hallway or But a goat man can chase you for half the dungeon. Yeah. Yeah, sorry go. No, that and I feel that way about like cut. I like love how the room design is in cut because it does feel like there are these little chunks. Mm-hmm. But you will get yourself stuck and have to like navigate back through mm-hmm. there's a lot of like good backtracking. And I think so that's I think that's the conceit I'm trying to away from Castle Blood is that half the encounters just wander onto the map and it's it's more about you saying I have to get through this very quickly before everyone dies. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I haven't uh, answered that question. I have not gotten a test in with the new strength die, uh, but we we'll, mm. uh, we were um, uh, Milda helped me uh, kind of rubber duck my way through some design on the on the uh, die the the strike die in Castle Blood. So oh nice yeah thank you. All right well let's uh, let's get to it. Let's stop talking about games we make or play and <laughs> play. So it's, <laughs> 
My thing's been dinging, so I'm gonna uh, no, I'm you, just gonna make sure you, we're okay. You, you here. sort through that, and I will I'll offer a uh, overview of what we're gonna do. Let's see what time is it. So it's just so we don't we don't chat too long. Uh, okay, so what we want to do is show you this. We have right here a big pile of NPCs, um, and we just want to show them to you. We're, this isn't gonna be like a full unboxing that would take a really long time. Uh, but we can just kind of like take out pieces, show some parts to the camera, and we can kind of talk about it. What I want to talk about particularly is how the product is a little different for Kickstarter backers than it will be for in retail users. Uh, nothing's exclusive. We haven't changed those rules. We don't like do promos or anything like that. But uh, I thought it might be a nice like kind of look behind the scenes of like how do you translate a Kickstarter product into a retail product and vice versa. Um, thank you, Kyle. <laughs> thank you, Kyle. <laughs> um, we're not going to be able to top that. Uh, so yeah, we would do that, and then um, if we have time left, uh, we can we can talk about the products we're working on. Yeah. Uh, both of them are kind of seeing some good progress through these past couple weeks, especially, and uh, we can take questions you folks might have about them. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is the last uh, design chat of the year. Mm -hmm. So if we have any like end of year cap stuff, we've been oh, doing yeah. these chats for a year. I think so. Yeah, well, yeah. We like started a, a, something like this during the pandemic. Yeah. In the earlier stages of the pandemic, and then it kind of morphed into, you know, my, pan my pandemic's still going on. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's we're just it's so big now. It's it's grown up to such a little endemic. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, okay. So um, let's talk through this. Uh, so if you backed at the lowest level, I'm going to move this keyword out of my way. We're putting a plaque for each of you in our <laughs> studio. It, yeah, only for the people who back. Uh, so you will get, of course, the river for uh, the, the river for the river for expansion, <laughs> the Marauder expansion, and then you'll also get uh, this set of Riverfolk hirelings in this handsome little box. Um, surprise all Riverfolk. Yeah, surprise for all Riverfolk, and then you get the landmarks pack. This is uh, the low. I believe this was like the low level back. Yes. Um, and we'll talk about what's in all those boxes here in a second. Yeah. Uh, and then, if you backed at the higher level of hirelings, you of course get this, and you get this. That's not all. And you get this. Oh, where are the knives? Um, you also get the Marauder hireling. Whoop. The referring. <laughs> okay, these. And then you also will get this lovely hireling box. So a lot of stuff. Um, this is heavy, my hands are shaking, there's a lot of, uh, just a lot of game. Um, now, this is an interesting, like, there's some interesting challenges that happen on the back end of this stuff when it comes to how do we take products that we were designing for Kickstarter backers and turn them into products that make sense for retail backers, because those are two very different audiences. And we also, when we go to do a Kickstarter, um, we know that we're, we're able to sell we're able to offer Kickstarter backers a much better deal because of how the profit margins are set up on a Kickstarter campaign uh, those margins are not sustainable when it comes to the retail life of product uh, of the product so we can't for instance you know root backers at the very beginning you know back in 2017 if they backed root they got river folk for free we couldn't just offer river folk for free forever so the hirelings uh, were an interesting an interesting thing here when we did the Kickstarter we basically uh, just had a big list of hirelings and we said, okay, these hirelings, they're gonna go for people backing at the lower level. And then the remainder of you know, the other 10 or whatever, not 10, 13, um, they get held by the players who are you know, backing at the slightly higher level. So in order to make this make any kind of sense, we created sort of the, hire, the hireling pack, this little product line piece. And uh, this is just a simple tuck box. There's nothing like too fancy about this. And I think actually a lot of folks will probably get rid of these boxes and integrate them into other boxes, and that's fine. And I'll, here, I'll show you what, what the Riverfolk one looks like. We'll just kind of pop it open here. So every one of these hireling packs, um, you can get even if you don't have a, a copy of any other expansions. They're all, uh, they all just require base root to play. Mm -hmm. So if you have root and you want to improve your, the two-player game, you can just pick up any hireling pack. It'll, it'll get you there. And it'll get you there because uh, they all come with a sheet of contracts. These are the little uh, timing pieces that you use to show how long you have control of a hireling, and they have a hireling die 
gear, which I guess, again, the camera's not really set up for close up. Sorry about that. I didn't want to do a two set, two camera setup today. There's a the little higher line dot. Because I would require three so we get the snow. So. Yeah, yeah, then we'd have to, yeah. we'd have to also set, we'd set up two. No one wants to do that. Um, and then uh, the other thing that you need to play with the hireling, so you need these two pieces of punch board, and then you need uh, this little hireling rule book, which is adorable. Patty did the layout on these. They look great. Uh, and then you you get uh, the big cards. And this is actually, you know, we say that there are 13 hirelings. They're really like 26 because every hireling has two variants and they are very different pieces mm -hmm. of design. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, I never like, I don't have any rule like I prefer the big side on all of them because I really, they're, they run the gamut. They do all sorts of things. Um, so it's really like you're getting 26 hirelings. It's a lot. Um, Garrick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Garrick. Um, and then you'll get a bag with all the different meeples, including this like lovely, uh, you can't really see it, lovely river folk meeple, and here are the other ones. So every hireling box has three hirelings in it. Um, two of them are based on previous, previously released factions. So the river folk hireling, you can guess, has the river folk hireling and the lizard folk, the lizard cult hireling. It also has a what we call a colorless hireling, um, which is a hireling in uh, we, we color them pink. Can I have the bandits? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was trying to get them for there you. There you go. Here are the bandits. They have a little pink stripe on them. Uh, and these don't correspond to any faction. Now, the reason this is this matters a lot is because when you play with the hirelings, if you're playing with a hireling, you can't play with a faction of the same color. So if there are orange pieces on the board because you're using like the cat hireling, for instance, you can't play with the cats in that game. Now, uh, this restriction is really important because it lets the hirelings um, sort of like get inside the design space of their parent faction in ways that open up a lot of new options for the game. Um, but it does shut down some play combinations. So we introduced these colorless hirelings, these little pink striped hirelings, which can be used with any faction. That's a really good idea. Thanks. Yeah. It works, works really well. Uh, okay, so uh, I just this illustration so charming. Oh, I know. Oh, 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 they're like, oh, they're just so cute. They don't have to do it themselves. There is so much good. There's so much good art, and some of the art is was also used on the Root RPG. So mm -hmm. if you were a Root RPG backer, mm -hmm. you'll see just a couple pieces. Not not a huge amount, but we did sh we did share a little bit because one of the things that happened with the Root RPG is that RPGs take a lot of art, mm -hmm. like a lot. And when we were going through the art list, Kyle did so much art for it that we essentially have like the shutter stock of Root. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like Root, animals, meeting around table, <laughs> there's like four images that I can use now. I don't even uh, go look at Dropbox. I just go look at Google Image search for our art at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's hilarious. Um, Oops. It's just easier to figure out. Uh, yeah, so that, that's how all these hireling, um, whoop, all these hireling packs work. You know, you're going to get... You're gonna get two faction hirelings uh, with two variations each, and then you get the third kind of colorless hireling uh, variation. And then uh, the idea, by the way, in terms of how these are boxed, I have to be careful to put these back as they need to go back. And we keep these first ones. I messed up. In case we're ever in court. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and we actually, so nobody accidentally takes them home, we label all of them yeah. with a big old label gun. Yeah. Um, Cause this is like, this is like the contract saying this is what we've agreed to. Yeah, yeah. So we have to well, and and there are times where you know we might look and say, hey, when that punch board printed, what was the drift like? Yeah. And yeah. One place we'll go to reference is like we're not going to unpunch this punch board right here, so that we have it for reference. Um, yeah. So we have like a little library of all the of all the production copies. I don't think we have like vast though. No, because I well, just use them. Well, and also vast uh, never got an NPC or never got a PPC. Yeah, I got, if I have the white copy at home, and yeah. I've been thinking about recycling it, then I think, oh, I'm not. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. So some of the stuff, you know. Yeah. So they, back then, you would get a copy that was just completely white. Like, they didn't print anything on it, and it was just to show you the form factor before yep. you signed off on it. Which is really important if you're, like, making an insert. You, like, want to, you know, you want, like, the weight. In when you think about how much this printing process has changed even in five years, it's kind of incredible yeah, how much faster it is. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think about some of the first games I worked on when I got the manufactured copy. That was, like, the first copy, any, even remotely yeah. looking like it, that I received. So that's an interesting question, dog food. I, I, uh, I, 
you know, I think about this. Do would you play with the hirelings by default? Um, if everyone knows how to play root, then then yes, yes, and then. For any game from two to definitely two to three player games, four player games sometimes. Mm -hmm. It really depends on the group and the amount of time that we have. I probably wouldn't play with them with five or six. Sure, but I can imagine a setting yeah. where I'd be like, "Yeah, you know what? This is Epic Root Day. We're gonna we're gonna put all <laughs> put, put everything on the." Table. I mean, that was my pitch in the in the you know when I was working on my. The Vagabond paired, paired version was like, hey, if you got a nice long winter day to play. Yeah, yeah, nice long winter <laughs> to, day. To play group. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I won't take out all of these, but I just want you to know that we have these set up here. There are no long winter days with kids. Uh, no. Uh, but then we also have uh, the hireling box. Here it is. Uh, now, the hireling box is designed, it's the same size as the fort box, and it will hold all of the hirelings. So even the hirelings in Marauder, of which there are four, you can put inside this box. And what I'm going to do with, with my copy of Root is I'm going to treat this hireling box like the little gate, the little doorway to playing Root. And so what's going to go in the hireling box are the starting items, the dice, the decks, maybe even like the resin clearing markers, mm -hmm. and all the hirelings. And they should all fit. It's going to be a little tight. It'll be a little bricky mm -hmm. box. Mm -hmm. But what I like about that is then, and all the advanced setup cards, because then when I want to play Root, I grab this box. And we can perform almost all the steps of the setup draft mm -hmm. just with this box. Mm -hmm. Or like all the, the initial steps, right? Mm -hmm. And then that will s determine which root boxes we, we pull down and what content we get. But I'm, I'm thinking about this as like, this is a little door. Um, and we, so we wanted a box that was substantial and substantial enough that players could put all the hirelings in. We also, we didn't want to create a situation where like, if you want to play with the hirelings, you probably want to play with all the hirelings at once, like cosmic, right? You want like, yeah. where's my big stack of aliens? And so having them split between a bunch of boxes would just make them hard to set up. Yeah. So we kind of, we want to put them all in, all in one box. Yeah, I, in fact, as there are more cosmic expansions, the fancy flight version, they're not going to fit in this box. That mm -hmm. size, because I have them all in the one. Oh, yeah, 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 it's, it's going to be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think. In fact, I think they don't. Yeah, because they are now beyond the point where you can't fit all of these. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I have, my box is full, uh -huh. and I'm kind of bummed out because I don't have the designer cosmic expansion. Oh, my God. So good. I know, it's I know, but so now I'm like, I, but then I have to, I have to keep another. Oh, just, just trim twenty dead ones from the, yeah. Take, um, the, take the laser out. <laughs> okay, well that's not bad. Um, so in this box, I'm gonna just open it up here. Um, I'm sorry, laser. <laughs> uh, yeah, so here, you know, we have uh, which? Oh, you know what? This is not right. I grabbed a joke box. I grabbed the PPC box. Sorry, not the NPC box. Now, actually, this is a good moment. What I'm doing right now is looking and seeing if I can tell. Wow, the, the large format printers they've been using have gotten so much better. Mm -hmm. You used to be able to always tell on the, on the blacks. Like, mm -hmm. if the blacks were not really pure, you would know that it was a PPC. Uh, the, the, they must have gotten nicer large format printers because it's almost impossible to tell. This is the MPC, and this is the PPC. And the PPC is made by hand. By hand. Essentially. Yep. Yeah. In a workshop. Yep. Um, okay. So, by someone who's very good at it. Yes. But, yeah. <laughs> not, so not some it, if you got the pledge level that gave you all the hirelings, you're going to get a hireling box that looks like this. And inside it is going to be the landmark pack and then all of the hirelings, including the hirelings from the river folk pack. Uh, they're all going to be in here. Uh, and you can see that, like, all of the hirelings in the game, there's tons of room. And, like, these landmarks, this box, you know, obviously is a lot larger than uh, it. W once you take the landmarks out of the box, you know, they're not going to take up this much room. So you should be able to fit a lot of stuff in this box. Maybe not both decks, but, you mm -hmm. know, the, the deck you want to play with. Uh, okay. So then, um, talking about product line, just mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so we had an interesting uh, problem on the, the back end of this that you know we didn't have to worry about uh, worry about you all with. But when we're, when it comes to selling these games, we have to find a way to package them in a way that makes retail sense. And so one of the problems was I really wanted to sell a hireling box, but we also didn't want like on principle to sell a box that was empty <laughs> because it, I don't know. Um, I, I, especially if we're not, if we don't have like an elaborate storage. Hero quest is a false bottom. I know. 
It just annoyed me. It was, yeah. Yep. All my HeroQuest stuff is now in one giant box. Yeah. And, yeah. and, it's sandwiched and I hope all the miniatures are touching. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. They're, the skeletons <laughs> are giving each other big hugs. Um, okay. So what we did then, and much credit goes to the full team here. I mean, like Nick Brockman had very excellent suggestions as well as Ted and, and Marshall and Carol and Brooke and folks on the uh, operations and marketing team as well. So uh, the way Roots line works is that we have these little hireling boxes that we talked about, which are going to be like kind of $20 retail mm -hmm. items. Um, and then the little hireling pack, which will be a $10 item. Mm -hmm. uh, not a hireling pack, the landmark pack. Oh, I'll show you the landmarks. Uh, well, I'll show them to you in a little bit. So this will be a little ten dollar item, like the Vagabond pack. It has a similar form yeah, factor. Yeah, I'll get it open for you. Well, oh, thanks. Well, yeah. And then uh, we will we have a, a product, this, which you'll note is just subtly different from this. It has the little badger on the side. Um, this is the Marauder Hirelings pack, and you can see how it, when it sits on the shelf, they're all cute. They got the little animals together, but this is just a fake front. Whoops. Uh, how did this get taped? It's, ah, it's been taped. Um, th this whole thing is just a temporary fold. This is just a piece of kind of thin, glossy paper so that when you peel this off, it looks just like this. Uh, and that allows us, you know, we really wanted to put a full art box back on this, but this is not a, this cannot be a retail product because someone's going to pick it up in a store and not know what they're buying. Sure. So we have, you know, a, a retail back. On, on the box for the, the, the retail yeah. version. Um, but yeah, it's the same box again. This is just, just pieces of paper on it. Um, and I can't stress this enough. Uh, nothing here is exclusive. If you miss the Kickstarter, you can still get late backs. If you're, yeah, you know, if yeah, you, if today. Want, yeah, yeah, if you want to back it, you can back it right now. You get a much better deal. Mm -hmm. um, but folks who purchase this game in a year and three years, they're going to be able to get all the stuff that we produced for the Kickstarter, it's just going to be packaged a little bit differently so that they make sense from a store owner's perspective. Hope that makes sense. Uh, Hi. Hi. I'm very happy suddenly. Okay, good. Just lots of glee today. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's the first, like, proper snow. It's a, well, it's the, this is, it's, it's 2021 and, and I'm fulfilling my boy to drink the producing yeah. games. <laughs> and it's also like, <clears throat> Three years into the life of Root. And yeah, we're. we're I, I'm speed, convinced we can do three. Up, yeah, yeah, speeding up, not slowing down. Here are the landmarks. Ah, uh, they're lovely. They looked really. They, they turned out really good. If I show a thumbs in chat, if Cole had three more of these, not the other stuff, just this, and with me drawing maps, could we do three more? Let's see. Oh, chat is just. Absolutely stony, stony silence. <laughs> <laughs> Yachts! Oh, my God. <clears throat> Have that box. Yeah, yeah of course. Mm -mm. Um, oh, the landmarks, other thing about them. Yeah, they're... they're There's they're a landmarks. no. <laughs> There's a no. Uh, murder Shoot, I'll buy Cosmic as soon as uh, FFG's done. <laughs> yeah, as soon as FFG's done. Yeah. I actually think that they... Um, I just went through like three screens. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, they, I think FFG has done a great job with Cosmic. I think they've done a great job too. I think they've been very good custodians of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. And um, and but if they are done with it voluntarily, yep. then I would be happy to put you it. Know, in I don't give FFG credit for much. But uh -huh. They've done a, they've done good by Cosmic. Um, anyway, here are the uh, the landmarks. You can see they've got images on them. Um, these cards are double sided uh, with backs on them that have the rest of the rules for it. So all the rules you need for the landmarks are directly on the cards themselves. Um, Kyle would draw the heck out of Cosmic. Sorry, I'm getting derailing this. No, 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 no. You're, you're fine. We can talk about Cosmic. But also, like, yeah, when it comes to root expansions, you know, we are waiting to see how this game, the, the, this season of expansions mm -hmm, does in mm -hmm. the wild before deciding what we want to do with root in the future. So that, yeah. that will be a conversation that we have, like, the middle of next year. Yeah, probably. so we're, we're going to see how the hireling box does versus a, a core. Yeah, versus a core, core box. Core, and if versus it, expansion, yeah. Yeah, yeah because we always want to be, you know, I don't think we ever want to get into a spot where it feels like the expansions are stale. We always want them to yeah. be kind of introducing something new. Like say that. Yeah, three boxes, by the way, that's not that's not realistic. Like, I mean, I, I don't think over I what scale of time, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> over six years, eight, sure. ten, maybe. It's so one every two years, I think we could do. But I, I mean, uh, you know, like I said on the chat, the root chat last night with the wires, I think I, I think I got one more faction in me. 
Mm-hmm. And I think you've, you've, got you've a, expressed like a number. A, yeah, I've got yeah. like a few. I yeah. think I could do a few. All right. But, uh, and I'll say, you know, Underworld fulfilled in 2019, mm-hmm. I think. I can't remember precisely. Um, but it, it, by the time people get this, it will be about you know two years since they would have gotten Underworld. So right. I, I like that pace because it doesn't it doesn't seem exhausting to me. Right, you know? and it, it allows us to grow the game organically and not just like you know have a ton of content. Um, this is the other you know when I when we think about our and then we can open up some more boxes when we think about our titles and how they're doing versus like other uh, companies. I won't name any names. Um, the most remarkable thing about the Marauder Kickstarter is that we didn't sell the core game during the Kickstarter. So mm-hmm. if you if you compare it to other games of similar scope, oh yeah, scale, I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. And you say like, how healthy is it based on the number of Kickstarter backers? Yeah, we we didn't sell core root, which means we probably could have done 25, 30, 50 percent better. Yeah, if we had done that. But this allows us to get a purer sense of how much enthusiasm exists for a game that is still living and not a game that people feel like, well, I just want to get the all in and move on, move on in my life. Right. right. And, and it won't break Ted Marshall in my brain trying to figure out how to get all this into the warehouse at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. It is, it is or, or, yeah, it, it came out. Some people got it at the very end of 2019. Most people got Underworld in early 2020. And people will be getting this. Uh, you know, in yeah, yeah. early ish 2022. Yeah. Uh, okay, clockwork. Yeah, let's do clockwork, yeah. Going. Let's do clockwork and then we'll, then we'll show Marauder. So here's clockwork, clockwork two. Um, this is a really cool expansion. Uh, you know, I think Schmaus, I think these bots are better than the other ones. They're just a lot, there's a lot of cleverness in, in this box. Um, also, several people on staff have said this is their favorite Kyle cover. Um, the clock really? Two, the clock or two box. It's very lovely. Um, we went ahead and did the same thing that we did with uh, the, the regular law. And so this law of robotics actually also includes the factions um, from the first clockwork, as well as factions from, of course, the new clockwork. Uh, and for the new clockwork, what we did, so here's the, the start of, of the new clockwork factions. Uh, what we did, or what uh, I should say, what Nick and Patty and Josh did, because I didn't even work on this too much, is uh, we did really long extended examples. So hopefully uh, this makes the, learning them even even better, even more fluid. I'm just thinking. Um, m- much help, uh, much thanks is also owed to our two interns, uh, Kaylee and Alito, who did a lot of playtesting on this. Because mm-hmm. they, they, they joined, our summer interns joined <laughs> right at the, right as we were finishing this, this project. And we were, you know, the end of a project is exhausting for the people who are on deck, who are working. But for the people like one degree outside of them, it's hard to know how to help. And so we just, we had these two interns that we need to like train. And we said, okay, well, one of the ways we're going to help you guys train is we're going to teach you how to play Root. And then we're going to have you be rules readers and help with the final playtesting checks. And they were great. You could be, you could be anywhere in college during summer. <laughs> and they were like, come on into leader games and play a bunch of solo games of Root. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they, they did, they did uh, great with it. They did a perfect job. Yeah. And then uh, here are the boards. Uh, we've got the River Folk. There's the Cogwheel Corvids. The Drillbit Dutchie. Uh... Logical Lizards, and then a corrected Eerie board for the folks who wanted it. Um, and the correction was just a very slight correction here. We also had like a sticker yeah. that folks get. Yeah. And you can download the PDF. Uh, but yeah, that's everything. And then, actually, that's not everything. Uh, we included an extra set of priority markers, so you don't need the first clockwork to play the second clockwork. And then my favorite thing in this expansion is that uh, there's a ton of cards. So in addition to there being trait and difficulty cards, Fanning these out. Uh, we also have Benjamin did uh, s- uh, cards for advanced interactions with the different river folks so they can interact with all the other factions in the game. Uh, there are new difficulties and traits for some of the core factions. There are three new Vagabond uh, bots. The Vagabond bot is awesome. Mm-hmm. It was the one I was most suspicious of because I felt like it seemed like a weird thing to automate. I, I felt like people would want to automate the cats before the Vagabond. Mm-hmm. Right, but actually, automating the vagabond is great because then it like it lets you play some of those higher reach factions. 
Uh, my favorite part about this is mm-hmm. that this would have never flown in Vast. Because we, we like to keep continue building on Vast, we would have had to come up with some very specific, like, whoop, yeah. whoop, whoop. But, you know, obviously here it's a little bit more limited scope. Yeah. So we can well, and also that. the fact that it's linked to the solo game and not the, like, standard player configurations is a big, big yep. difference. Uh, yeah, it's a giant... It's a giant deck. You want to see those in the back? Oh, yeah. Sure. Move Absolutely. Next I'll move on. Yeah. Um, they, did you show these? Yes, I showed okay. these. Yeah, I like, I like that. Um, yeah, nice, We're good. We, can go, a little, we can go a little late. It's yeah, 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 it's fine. It's fine. What are we doing today? Designing the next product that Leader Games I know. will be selling? We're in, we're in like a weird time because I feel like... Uh, wait, wait. Yeah. Um, I feel like on the one hand, very b- harried and busy, uh, busy lately. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, it's a beautiful, quiet day, and it's gorgeous outside. And, it's it's all, and like Santa's coming. And Santa's coming, and yeah. not, the night is silent, etc. Um, okay. Here it is. This is the Marauder expansion. Um, it'll be a $50 expansion, uh, just like Underworld. Uh-huh. River Focus 40, right? I think. Yeah, think Riverhawk's 40 and uh, Underworld's 50. Yep. And, yep. Uh, you know, basically, you, in Underworld, you get two main factions and then the map, and in this, you get two main factions and you get the higher links. So, uh, you also get the setup, the advanced setup cards. Uh, okay, so, key things here. Uh, the learn to play for, which, again, great layout. Um, funny thing, I'll, two bits of trivia about learn to plays, which I think I may have shared before, but I'll share it again. Um, this is... A, a very weird document. We had a graphic designer who worked for us for like a week. <laughs> and the one thing that she had to do was design the, the cover for the learner. It was like the first thing of many things, but then uh, it, the, the, the job didn't work out. She went in a different direction, and I hope she's doing great. Uh, but she designed the layout for the learn to play, and I really liked it, and so we've mm-hmm. just kept using it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is... Uh, I'm yeah, gonna... absolutely no hard feelings. Oh, she, yeah, no, she, no, no, no. she just got a better offer from her employer. And, 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 and at that time, time, we couldn't yeah. counter it, so yep. there was no way. Yep. Uh, but it, it was, she was great. Um, and uh, so one thing is, you know, she did this, this layout, and she will be forever in the root credits. Forever. Um, <laughs> uh, and then the other thing is um, this rule book. So the example, the little walking through root example, um, that is a, is a traditional chapbook size. Mm. Uh, this, the size of this rule book is the same size as the My Little Golden Books. Mm. And so there we had some, I got to have some book, book nerd out with this because we wanted to have a clear, in the size of the document, we wanted it to suggest at what point you should open the document. So mm-hmm. the smaller the, the thing, mm-hmm. the more kind of like beginner and starter. And then mm-hmm. as it gets up to the big f- format, mm-hmm. you're all ready to go. Uh, so we did something a little different. Normally, learn to plays are eight pages for expansions. That's true for River Folk and Underworld, I believe. Um, but we have found that a lot of people, uh, and so, you know, as we would design the learn to plays, as Josh w- would really design them, uh, you know, usually the rule is like they should have 80% of the rules, mm-hmm. right? So a player can get, basically they can start playing from reading it. They might need to consult the law a couple times. Uh, but for a lot of players, they only use this document. And mm-hmm. so what we did with this one is, it is, uh, this is a 20 page rule book and there are many more examples, and I think it's rules complete. If it's not rules complete, it's very, very, very mm-hmm. close. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, it just really takes you through everything. Uh, also, the rules for the hirelings are in here with examples, um, as well as some advanced setup stuff. And then as is our tradition, at the very last the very last page that gets designed into these products is this page where we all bicker about what we think are the best faction combinations, uh, and then we, we throw them up on a comically small selection for the amount of different faction combinations that actually work. That yeah, worked. We're just trying to get it to work. Um, I, yes. I think I learned Oath the wrong... Like, I got there. Sure. I think I used the law more than... Yeah, I... The yeah, technical the, the, version, the, whatever it's called. Yeah, the, yeah, it's the law. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, the law. The law is just so much shorter than the yeah, playbook. No, that was my, that, that was my, yeah. I was like, I just want to be succinct in teaching him. Um, that's how, like, how I read, how I learned Mage Knight. Mm-hmm. I, like, started reading the Mage Knight tutorial books and was like, I don't like this at all. And I just read, like, the bullet list rules. Sure. And they're just so much shorter. Uh, so here's the law. This law is a significant expansion from the previous law. The previous law was 16 pages. And the new law is uh, 24. Um, the reason why it's a big expansion, uh, there are a few reasons for it. So one reason is that we added 
a very long set of appendices, which actually, you know, if you think about the old rules as being 12 or 16 pages, the appendices start on page 17, and that's the back mm -hmm. half. The appendices have complete component lists for all products. It has the advanced setup rules. It has all the rules for the variant maps. It has all the vagabond rules. It has all the hireling rules. It has a glossary and an index. So we really built out the back half for mm -hmm. folks who use this book a lot and you know want everything in the right place. Uh, we also had to go through and slightly retool some of the core actions of the game. Nothing changed in terms of the balance mm -hmm. uh, or in terms of the, the mechanics, but like actually how the sentence was worded, we adjusted some of the wordings to make room for the hirelings mm -hmm. and for things like that. So these are rules like, um, let me see if I can find one that will jump to mind. Um, we, I think we changed like how the, the wording for like declaring a battle. Uh, we also talked, uh, there, I think there's a section on like use as effects and that got changed a little bit. Um, so it's it's real small nerd stuff in here, but mm -hmm. this book got a lot of expansion and clarification and we're really happy with how the law how the law turned out. You could tell me that the rules to moving changed and I would be like, well, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it, look, it had to happen. Um, and then we have the boards. Here they are. Uh, oops, I'm covering up the art. That's not good. There we go. Lovely, lovely faction boards and their backs. Uh, and then here's the punch board. <gasps> it's that candy. I love. Don't punch it. Ah, no. I just I, said. I know, I know. Get back in there. It's going to get record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and here's the punch board. I love laying out punch. It's one of my favorite parts of the project. Uh, it's exhausting and you know, in a way that I don't know, I find very pleasing. I use it to catch up on radio. I'm interested. It's exhausting. It's an interesting. It is, you're working in hundredths of millimeters. Fair enough. And so you just really go in there. You have to go in, I mean, so one of the first steps of laying out punch is you have to turn off all of the, the point snapping in Illustrator and in InDesign. Right, right. Because you really have to be very, very precise. And you just go one at a time. And yeah. you just slowly check it and you recheck it. and That is literally how I do all my layouts. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, um, I guess I'm just used to it. Yeah, really, yeah I, I really like it. And it's just, it's also like a fun puzzle, right? You're trying to figure out how many pieces can you fit on the boards? What's the efficient way to lay it out? And so the, the root project, Marauder had like six punch board or something because they're across several products. Yeah. Um, yeah, there it is. There's the punch. And, and, and yes, the replacement VP yep, or they, the Pagamon. So right here, I don't know if it's easy to see this. These are the added relationship markers that were needed for the Crows and the Duchy, mm -hmm. for the folks who want to play double Vagabond with those factions. Uh, and then you'll note that the new factions both have two relationship markers for the same reason. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom, you'll note that we have victory markers for all the factions in the game. And this is because the first... And second printings of Root had uh, the letters VP here, yeah. uh, which were not friendly to all language groups. Sure. And so we switched in the third printing to having a little laurel with the head in the faction head in the middle. And so for anybody who wants to upgrade their VP tokens, we just went ahead and put them all on the, on the punch board sheet. Um, we had all that space at the bottom. We had all that space at the bottom. We actually made the sheet longer because we didn't have space. And so we need to make, make the punch board just a tiny bit longer. Um, so then we got a lot of wood. Uh, big bag of uh, the Warlord's pieces. Big bag of the Keeper's pieces. Um, this, is a, this is a first, the very first uh, metallic root meeple. Mm -hmm. uh, they turned out so good. Mm -hmm. I really like this. Uh, really like that meeple. Uh, and then here are the dice. We have uh, the hireling dice, the mob die for the warlord, and the alliance hireling mm -hmm. has, has, a, has a die. Uh, this is kind of a fun die, and I'm excited to see if anybody cooks up anything with it. This is a die that has um, two heads of every faction. Or not every faction, every, uh, every suit. Two, yeah. Yep, so there's two bunnies, two foxes, and two mice on this. Um, big die. And, you know, it's a... We can all sorts of things can be done with that with that dice. Uh, so it's kind of fun to put those in. Uh, and then for the hirelings. So here's uh, I don't know why the warlord is hiding in that bag, but he's hire, hanging out with the with the eerie hirelings. He's charismatic. Uh, we finally have a bear meeple. So you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> just, 
And then here's all of the cats. Um, hey, you're kind of bearing the lead on this one, though. Yeah, There's sorry, also a bunny. Oh, yeah, we also yeah, have a bunny. Finally, have bunny. This is the finally bag. We finally yes. have bears and bunny. Yeah, we finally have bears and bunny. And then uh, for the cats, or not for the cats, uh, we have these advanced setup cards featuring a cat. And then on the back of these are the setup instructions for all the factions. So that if you've played Root like a couple times, just use advanced setup. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean. I mean, even, even I say that. Yeah, I, I think just, just use, I mean, I would honestly teach the game with advanced setup and just help someone with their, with their setup. Uh, I love Kyle's card, card art, the card art he does for backs. Uh, it's one of my favorite pieces. Kyle usually do, does card backs very late in the process, and I think his card backs are exceptional. Um, I was commenting on the ad set one because I don't think I saw it until the PPC, and I I, it, I love it a lot. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, the, the layout of the advanced set. I mean, of course, I like the warlords. It is really yeah. good. Uh, but I like I love the faithful retainers, which are these with the feather. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have our little overview cards, uh, and then here are the moods, mm -hmm. which uh, Nick said huge Hellboy energy. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, and then and then there are uh, the hireling cards are in there too. So if you you know if you back to the level where especially where if you get all the hirelings, you've got a lot of root. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to explore. I mean, that's 26, basically 26 different abilities, two new factions, new way of setting up the game. There's just a lot of stuff. Even if you've played root a lot, uh, it's gonna it's gonna mix it up in some really fundamental ways. Somebody on BDG played all 24 Spree Dine factions in a solo game. Mm -hmm. I feel like I need to see that. I need to witness that now for Root. For Root, just the, just the, the 12. Ten, the, 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 yeah, the 11 would be 10 plus the second. Yeah, one, yeah, right? the 11, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, there you go. That Those are the NPCs. So they're all here. In terms of schedule, I can't stress this enough, uh, these are currently being assembled right now in the factory in China. So this is an early copy. This copy got sent to us. It didn't even go through like the rest of the drawing cycle because as soon as they had yeah. it, they were like, get it over there. Um, they will be assembling it and then it's kind of anyone's guess precisely when assembly finishes, when we get shipping booked, when sh our shipping booking is successful, how easy is it, is to, how easy is it to get to the, from the port to the fulfillment center how easy is it to get out of the fulfillment center? There are just so many questions right now. Right. Um, and like, you know, on the other hand, don't panic because we're starting now. Because we're, yeah. we're not starting now. It's the meeples have been in production for months. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's going. I mean, I think it's, it's like a waterfall. You have to like you have to everything has to arrive at the same time. No, I mean yeah. we guessed. You know, this project uh, when we put it on Kickstarter earlier this year, we guessed that we'd be ready by January. And we're going to be a few months off, but like, given the the scope of the supply chain problems, that is nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> it's just nothing. We tried to buy Christmas tree lights lately. Oh yeah, <laughs> man. Um, you can only yeah. get the, you only get the fancy ones right now. Uh, do 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 do. Uh, do the new clockwork rules have mechanics for buying from river folk or guessing plots? Uh, yes to the buying from river folk. Buying from river folk. Guessing plots. I'm not sure. Uh, I cannot remember because it's been a while since I played the Corvid bot. Um, in your opinion, is it worse for the moles to experience price of failure or the lizards to experience fear of the faithful? Oh, for the lizards. It, losing cards out of your hand to the lizards. There's just no way to protect against it, really. And it, it can, it's bad. Uh, okay. Um, so someone... Let, let's go to questions. I have though. questions. You've got questions. Yeah, sorry. I'm okay. Uh, I have a question about... Someone gave me a question about the Vagabond style of arcs, which I can answer, but do you are, you, are your questions about Marauder? Yeah, I got I got questions off, okay. off the internet. I'm going to hold your arcs question. I'll get back to it. Okay. So, this is from Facebook. Okay. So we're not watching Facebook. Hi, Facebook. Hello, Facebook. And I... I this is... Slack no longer remembers the channel you're in. Uh... I have a question about the clockwork box size. I know it's the same box size used for every expansion, but don't you think it's a little excessively big? Traditions, well, they, okay, that's not real with them. Uh, but uh, Twitter asked. 
Wait, I'm going to answer that question. Go right ahead. About, about the clockwork size. It's because of the... Yeah, so board. here's the thing about the clockwork box size. Someone's like... Someone says on Facebook that they think it might be too big. Yep. Well, maybe. But if you make it thinner than this, if it's sitting in a store, it will fall over. And so this is kind of like the minimum thickness you want for a box of this width and height. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, you know... That's kind of it. I mean, you know, we have there's there's a lot of different vectors when it comes to deciding like the size of something. I think in that box, I'm a little, a little concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. yep. Uh, I was this morning if Brian Boro, Boru, Brian Boru, yeah, had and will have any effect on the direction of arcs. Um, First of all, yes. Who is Brian Boru? Brian Boru is uh, king that united Scotland in wow. the Middle Ages. Uh, not Scotland, Ireland. Whoa, blah. Brian Brew, Unified Ireland there's in some, the Middle Ages. There's some Irish and Scottish people very irate now in the chat. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I just it just popped out of my brain. Yeah. Um, and it's a uh, design by Paris Sylvester, who also designed The King Is Dead, The King of Siam, Polynesia, uh, Lost Expedition, many many interesting games. Uh -huh. um, Brian Brew is good. It's a it's an interesting trick taker. I have a copy lying around. Oh, actually, look at this. Look at this. It's Brian Brew, everyone. Just hiding there on my shelf. Um, Brian Brew is interesting uh, because it's the second time in my uh, short design career where I have uh, run parallel to what Pierre, Pierre is doing. Um, because when I was working on Pamir, um, I played King of Siam and thought, oh, well, this game does everything I want Pamir to do in like half as many, a quarter as many, a fifth as many rules. Uh, and so uh, that, you know, King of Siam really changed how Pamir was developed. Now, Brian Baru has not really changed arcs at all. Uh, and that's because I, uh, I'm much further along in the design process. Uh, instead, it was just very interesting to, to play uh, because I can see Pierre, uh, Pierre uh, encountering the exact same questions that I encountered with arcs and almost always making the opposite choices as the choices that I made. And it was, it was very interesting. I played it with, with, uh, with, with some people here who, who played ARCs in very early versions, and they had very similar impressions that it was, it was so weird. It was like meeting a version of yourself that made all these different choices like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so the games were very, very, very different. Um, but I am excited that uh, you know, people are using the trick-taking format. Uh, although both games are not trick-taking in the traditional sense, uh, in, in that you can kind of, you know, you're, you're not concerned with like playing off and playing on so much. Um, they're really more like, well, I don't want to go that far. I was going to say, I, th I think that there is a subgenre of trick taking games mm -hmm. that is a lot um, more about action auctions. Mm -hmm. And I think both Arcs and Brian Brew are like in that category. Sure. Um, Arcs is a lot meaner than Brian Brew, a lot meaner. Um, and, and that isn't to say that Brian Brew isn't, isn't a mean game because it does have some sharp edges. But I think Pear's game is very much uh, a traditional German game in the sense that, like, if you get smacked hard, there's going to be, like, a little pot of porridge and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, like, a warm blanket <laughs> uh, that, that you can have. And Arcs will just, will just throw you into a nebula. I have to cry. Like, I go home and I have a good cry every time I play, <laughs> I play Arcs. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, great question. Somebody asked how Oath sales are doing. Um, I don't have any like year-to-date stats or anything weird like that. But considering it's twice as much, essentially. Yeah, I mean, like good. Is it's the, it's is good. As good as yeah. Like we're so, we're up around sixty thousand sold, mm -hmm. and we have another thirty thousand on the way. So that's we're we're doing fine. Yeah, and and Oath was one where that so we had never made a game that big. Yep. Uh, and it was also, we, we had kind of never designed a game that heavy. Mm -hmm. And so it was a risk on both of those fronts. Like there was a question of like, wow, do people want to spend this much money on a game? And r thing two is, do people want to play a game that has this many rules? And uh, its sales are... They're more than fast. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're more than the first year of Root, but it's just because our bandwidth has been big enough yeah. to, to, to catch it. I mean, it, it is, Oath has sold... 
really, really, really well. If if uh, if Patrick was just in this for a money, he would be forcing me to make an Oath expansion right now. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that, that is the obvious thing that we should be doing, is yeah. making an Oath expansion. Well, I took some of your hair in, yeah. <laughs> in the summer. Yeah. There's another coal living in my basement. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, I think uh, Oath is selling really, really well. It will probably sell well enough to uh, have us support it in some long way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think we're going to jump into that. No, I, I'm not yet. in any hurry. Yeah. 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 I'm not in yeah. any hurry to do it. I, I mean, you know, if I was in it for the money, I'd be, we'd be doing Root Kickstarter, right? <laughs> we'd be doing Root right now. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and one of the things about Oath that I find really encouraging is I'm seeing a lot of people who have played the game more than 20 times. Yeah. And that, that's the same thing that happened with, with, with Root, where it's like, yeah, some people are glancing off of it. Right. Fine. Right. But there are people who are finding 20, 30, 40 plays in the game. Right. Which is great. Because that's showing a real, you know, the game has real legs. Um, Cornelius there said, um, we need two neighboring boards, like uh, like that Dead of Winter expansion. They're fighting, oh, yeah. they're fighting <laughs> they're with just, each other. Yeah. I'm into this. Because uh, um, I've proposed the dungeon board, which is the talisman <laughs> corner board on the side of... We could just use the dungeon board. From <laughs> <left out. laughs> uh, there, there's a designer named Rick Helly who was a huge fan of the game Republic of Rome. Uh -huh. And he designed this game called Republic of Carthage, which was his way of fixing Republic of Rome. But also there was a mode in it yeah. that allowed you to have Republic of Rome versus Republic of Carthage. Nice. And the games could just fight each other. Uh, we know Cornelius. I was just, uh, I like jokes. <laughs> if, if Cole will say any defining trait about me, I like some jokes. Mm. Patrick likes jokes. Um, so someone asked about the ARCs solo mode, which I'm happy to talk about. Do we have any other Marauder questions that you want to get to? No, I don't have anything here written okay. down. So. Sorry, not the ARC solo mode. Time out. ARCs will not have a solo mode, at least not in the immediate future. Um, so the no, the nomad mode in in arcs. So uh, to for folks who uh, haven't heard we talk about arcs, basically um, arcs is kind of like halfway between root, halfway between oath, but simpler than mm -hmm. either game mm -hmm. um, and a, and shorter than either game. Uh, it's not a light game by any means. It just has a bit of a different character. Um, I think about arcs as kind of one four-hour game that was divided up into two to four like 60-minute sessions mm -hmm. um, and so like you get a big kind of like space trilogy feel um, over a, you know a couple sessions for some people uh, you know maybe you, you get together with your friends and play a couple matches and then next week you do the finale or an intrepid group could easily sit down and play the whole thing mm -hmm. um, in that game, uh, different narrative switches get thrown on and off. Players are, at the beginning of every game, confronted with uh, a number of narrative choices that they're going to make, which are going to determine the character of that game. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're, they're going to have kind of a main plot line that they can pursue, and they can either continue the one they were pursuing, or they could pivot to a different one. Mm -hmm. Some of those plot lines will force you to leave behind your little space empire. Right. Uh, and you put everybody in one ship and you fly around. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that works, I'm looking to see if I have a board ease that's easily accessible uh, that I can use to demonstrate this. That's a plant. <laughs> he likes jokes. Um, the, way, the way this works is um, the regular player board in ARCs, ha players have like between six and eight technology slots. Here's an article about fresh fish. There's an article Not about helping. fresh fish. No. Uh, it, it's fine. So a regular uh, faction board in ARCs has kind of like seven or eight technology slots, one slot per unit. Uh, so as you get technologies in the game, you kind of put them in slots. They change how your pieces work. When you flip your board over to its kind of like mothership side, uh, some of those slots are taken up. Here, I'll show you, actually. It's sitting right here. Some of those slots, this is a playtest board, are now taken up by your mothership piece that's right here. Mm -hmm. uh, which means that when you're in this mode, you can't build buildings. So imagine playing the cats, and halfway, you know, a after a round of the cats, you want to play the cats for the second game, but instead you load all of your characters into a big cart. And then you n are playing the cats, but you no longer have the ability to build buildings. You have other abilities instead. And this fixes a, uh, 
a really interesting design problem that I was running into with arcs. Because one of the things about arcs campaign is I wanted the player positions to be a lot more seamless. So when you finish game one, you take that player position directly into game two. So it means if you ended game one by building a giant army, you start with that giant army. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, uh, if I beat someone to a pulp in a game, mm -hmm. during the next game they have nothing. Right. And so instead of that like moment of carrying over to the new game as being something joyous, it's something like horrible. <laughs> and no one, no one wants that. Um, my you know, the inherent problem with all campaign games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like sometimes yes. it ain't fun. And, you know, like the, the game, is, like the story is over. So what will happen in arcs is that oftentimes if you lose, if you're losing, um, the, those little narrative choices you have will say like, "Wow, you you got yourself really messed up." Uh, the option before you is, do you want to stay and try to build a research station this game, or do you want to flee? and try to like fly your civilization into the sun or something. Mm -hmm. And if you pick that option B, it'll, it'll say on the card, it'll instruct you like, hey, flip your player board over, read the little rules about how single ship play works, and mm -hmm. then you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. um, single ship mode, uh, you can still have ships and techs. You actually still participate in all the game's action systems. You just can't build buildings. And your whole play style changes to be around one piece. And there are ways where you can migrate from a little civilization to a single piece, and then from a single piece back to a civilization. Mm -hmm. um, originally, this was a core element of the game, like players just had the ability to like toggle a switch to turn to a Vagabond, mm -hmm. uh, did not work. And so I had to build it more, um, I had to curate it a little mm -hmm. bit more, and so now it's actually part of the narrative structure. Like the, Depending on how you do on missions, the game will tell you if you're allowed to like switch modes sure. or not. Should we have the... Should we have that as an expansion for root? You can switch into the back. If I like, did a root, there was this idea when we were working on Oath. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote up these campaign rules for root mm -hmm. that were like very oathy, and the idea was every root faction would have two versions: a mm -hmm. version with buildings and a version without buildings. Right. And so, if you won a game of root, or if you performed well enough, you got to like be the building version for the next game. Right. And if you lost. You would go to like the vagabond version of the faction. Right. Uh, this was a very exciting project for me. I like had a map and thought like, oh, you know, like you'd have little empires on the board, and then you know, one player chooses what province they're going to fight over, and then you yeah, have I remember that. The board. Yeah. Yep. And I even uh, borrowing from Titan had it where all the different maps, like you know, there are four root maps, would have different rotations depending on how they were positioned in the board. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. So like, if you've played Titan, you'll you'll know what the heck I'm talking about. But basically. You know, the orientation of even the map is dependent on its mm -hmm. location on the board. Anyway, I realized that executing this plan would require probably two years of work. Mm -hmm. And I should probably just finish Oath instead. And yeah. Maybe, and maybe work on something new. Yeah. Um, games take a long time to make. Yeah, they do. Um, I'm, I'm sad. I'm sad that's true because I want to work on Path also. Uh, one, I'll take a little Arcs question and then I want to talk to Patrick about his game. Uh, Arcs, when uh, when will Arcs play Destiny begin on TTS? Uh, probably like February or a little bit later. Um, the only reason why it's not on TTS now is because I am um, just doing it uh, physical only. Oath's playtesting and John Company's playtesting were both done almost entirely online. And I wanted... Arcs. I just really wanted to do it analog, like to. I mean, to not. That's a weird way to put it. I, I really wanted to do it in real life. I wanted to be. A, it was a game on the table because it's a card game, and I want to understand like the feelings of playing the cards and really tap mm -hmm. the room. So mm -hmm. I, I forced myself to work almost entirely in person. There is no, not even. There's not even an internal TTS for Arcs yet. It's just in. And the know, files wouldn't even be formatted for it. And yeah, I, yeah. So I'm going to be building it. Hopefully in January, I'll start building it into TTS. There's one. The game is an interesting place right now, where the core design is done. It's actually the core design of Arcs is further along than Oath was when we launched the Kickstarter. It yeah. is good. Um, the victory system is still getting adjustment, and the content system is still getting adjusted because there's just. It's a weird game. Like, imagine playing an open world game. You know, like, imagine you, you boot up Skyrim and, like, none of the NPCs talk and none of the quests work. Yeah. Like, the game is system complete. You know, you, right. you can swing an axe and get all the spells and do all that stuff. But the content is such an important part of the game right. that I can't really advance the testing until 
all the content stuff. Right. Uh, so that's been the, the process of the last couple of weeks, and also working on the, uh, the the single ship mode has been a, has been an important thing. I'm hoping to have all that firing by Christmas, and then January is going to be about getting it getting it ready to show people and expand testing. And work us working on content, the larger content. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, so Patrick, what's the timeline? What's the timeline for? But can we the talk about the, we can talk about the whole timeline? Is that I don't know what yeah. Rick has cleared us for. I mean, we can talk about whatever. I don't, we're not going to talk uh, dates. The CEO. Yeah, the CEO. Yeah. You. Right. Yeah. This is like. Uh, <laughs> can the president break the law? <laughs> um, uh, wow, Brooke is just she's red. No. Uh, so uh, Ahoy will be done soon. Yeah, it is um, in the very final stages. Yeah, and that will go to the printer, like, basically now. Like, not now, but, like... By Christmas. By Christmas, it'll be at the printer, yeah. And then, um... I don't, really don't know when that's going to be for sale, because, again, pandemic is really messing with, um... Yeah. Uh, it's really messing with... We are, we are hoping that it will be, like, a Gen Con release. Yeah. But, like, we're not. Yeah, we're not, yeah. But I'm not, like... I'm cautiously optimistic, yeah. as, as, as Bart would say. Uh, so Hawaii, uh, is almost done. It's fantastic. I have actually been kind of sequestered myself lately, so I haven't played it much last, uh, recently. Um, and then, um, we'll do this Kickstarter for, for ARCs and, um. Yeah, probably like Q2. Yeah. 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 yeah pretty quick. Um, I'm really tired all of a sudden. Talking is exhausting, though. That's exhausting. Yeah. I'm going to drink a little coffee, and then I'll finish. I'm going to rally. All right. Uh, and so, yeah, and so I've been working on, uh, well, I mean, I was working on Dungeon Fortress where Alice is born, but, like, yeah. um, which is a dangerous name. <laughs> I try not to say her name publicly. Um, so, uh, so I resurrected it this summer after bombing uh, Havoc and... Um, Ublia, which is mm -hmm. two earlier designs, and I've been just working on my earlier designs bases. I guess Havoc was from Kyle's recommendation last December. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I've been working on that. I think we're kind of aiming for like next fall for yep. like a like a Kickstarter launch, uh, but we'll see. Uh, I I did fall a little bit behind the last couple of months because administration time and my own. Mm -hmm. Um, there's just been some yeah, yeah there's yeah. just been some artistic issues with me there's a very real chance we have two kickstarters next yeah, year which will yeah. be the first that'll be the first for the company yep uh, and so I'm working on I'm working on that I think the kind of the handoff not the handoff date but like the like bring more staff in will be sometime in early February or mm -hmm. in January and we'll, we'll be uh, we'll be doing uh Dungeon Fortress or Dark really so, it was yeah, kind of, so we, we need to aim, we need to aim for that how about mean mean <laughs> uh and so um and so that's that's where we'll be we'll be going on with dark and dark's coming along fine it's um now i mean cole kind of had a discussion with me last week and was like let's get past this and so we're getting past it yeah. and uh and it's good it's been a it's been a very productive uh energy uh to bring back to the project mm -hmm. and work on uh, we were I during August I was basically like prototyping it every day and I just like that was a lot of work and yeah. then I needed to like sit and let it blend for a bit and then I, I tried a couple of slower uh, approaches to it and now I'm now I'm on board and it's hitting the four X as well so I'm mm -hmm. putting I'm putting the Explorer X in right yeah. now and uh, I'm very excited but you, you can you can tunnel through the dark and find um, resources that you can't normally get in the game. So I'm excited about that. So. Yeah, there's a funny thing happening with how it uh, how it compares to ARCs, too, mm -hmm. where ARCs is a game that looks like a Space 4X, but is actually a kind of, like, narrative action auction, mm -hmm. like, oathy game. Mm -hmm. And Dungeon Fortress, or Dark, looks like a fantasy game, mm -hmm. but is actually a 4X underground Yes, uh, and like has so I think that there's like weird there are weird ways in those games uh, like similarities and very and, but very very diff different games in their scope and approach. And I think arcs the map won't fight you as much. No, yeah, because I'm putting in putting in a few mobs. Yeah, and then uh, the um, 
if you attack the surface too much, inventors will come down and, and mess break your stuff. So I haven't got there yet. That's yeah. that's kind of a hard stuff to add. Yeah, Arcs has it doesn't have an empty map because it does have mobs basically, but it's they're not hard. It just is a soft pressure to sure. stop from sure. growing. Whereas I, I want you to die sometimes when you enter. In, in the maps, so like so here's another weird comparison between the games. Arcs is a map that if I were to show it to you right now looks like a root map, mm -hmm. but with eighteen clearings not mm -hmm. 12 and actually maybe like 25 27 spaces mm -hmm. the so it, it it looks it looks like uh root though mm -hmm. i mean just because it's it's lines and circles mm -hmm. uh the dark map is a grid yeah that players tunnel through yeah uh they, they needed a grid because you got a tunnel yeah you got a tunnel. Yeah. and yeah. it has i mean the thing that i and i mean this very affectionately the thing that dark makes you think of is cave evil mm -hmm. but you know, less metal and more Kyle Farron. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, I want metal. Um, yeah, so I've been working on that, and um, uh, it's kind of it's switched to kind of an action drafting system um, on cards, and they'll have various costs. So I'm Saint Peting a little mm -hmm. right now. If you or is it Saint Pete? Is that the name of the game? Saint, Saint Petersburg. Yeah. yeah, with the drafting. Yeah, so the co the cost like starts to come down the longer the action sitting out there mm -hmm. and uh that's when that, I, that was a great you know i didn't play many turns but it was a good play test i like that yeah i'm uh, excited to play it more to speak I'm, I'm i like that concept a lot yeah and uh and the villains have become a lot more flushed out with the with the exploit part kind of coming into play coming mm -hmm. to focus a little more so yeah it's good uh let's see if there's anything that we uh, what weight am i shooting for <laughs> that's probably that's a good question uh, it is well. That that is a good question. Like I think, I think arcs is less complicated than root mm -hmm. and less than oath. Mm -hmm. um, and I think dark is probably in a similar weight or even a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. It's heavier than ahoy, mm -hmm. but it seems like less than root. It's interesting because I think you would sit down and design document and say what you want the weight to be, mm -hmm. and I'd be like. I would say something like, I want it to be like X, but if I don't get there, yeah, then it's, then yeah. it's okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I don't, I don't know if, if the weight is a decided thing for, for arcs. I have like, I have a, I have a little design list of like rule, like laws for my own practice. Mm -hmm. And one of them is I want a quick start rules that are four pages long for mm -hmm. arcs where someone can open up the box and look at a single sheet of paper that's been folded in half and read through those and be like ready to play. They won't know everything, right. but they're ready to play. And everything I do is at the, almost everything I, I do in terms of the design is at the service of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, I could see Dark doing that. I could right. also see a heavier version of Dark. Right. Um, and, you know, who knows? So what they're asking is what makes it different than other 4X games. And I think one of the, and for me, I've been playing a lot of Stellaris. I've played a lot of Stellaris in my life. And I role play now when I play Stellaris. I don't play Stellaris as a warrior anymore. And for me, what I want to see hitting right is that it feels like you're the head of a chaotic evil organization. Mm -hmm. So instead, if you, if you build a second city, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you have perfect control of it. You get to decide what they produce. Mm -hmm. And in Dark, I want there to be a little bit more like, no, you grew too fast, and now now, you're, now things are going to fall apart a little bit because mm -hmm. your, your troops aren't loyal to you. They're loyal to their own interests. And, and uh, we'll see if we get there. That's, yeah. that's going to be challenging. So. Yeah, that you know that's interesting. I feel like dark is much more. Um, just I'm, I'm doing this is a comparison between dark and arcs. Yeah, dark I think is a lot more tied into four X design questions right. and like what's happening in Stellaris and Civ and those yeah, yeah. Like that design conversation. And arcs is like way not arcs is uh, you know right now I'm reading. I just finished Jacob Rinsler's History of the Making of Star Wars, and I'm like just reading like weird sci-fi epics and mm. books about making sci-fi epics mm -hmm. because it's and, and so Arcs is weirdly not tied to like any 4x game that I can think of. Right, um, it, has, it has its its own its own thing. Whereas I think you and I have both played a lot of turn-based yeah games yep uh, strategy games and. It's always interesting to see board games re respond to what video games are doing. Yeah, and I think your plays are still st like I love hearing about what you're what you're doing in Stellaris because you are like engaging in a critique of that form while you're you're playing it. Right, right. And, and, and then <laughs> that critique gets expressed in what you're doing with with sure. with, with Dark. Um, sure. So I'm, I'm I'm excited to see it. 
May, it may be too reactionary. Um, <laughs> so Vast Three, I, yeah, I, I took a pass at it a couple months ago. I haven't I haven't looked at it lately. Uh, it would be neat if I had the energy to finish four games at once, but I I do not have the energy to finish four games at once. So yeah, that's yeah. a lot of work. Yeah, um, as we're kind of night. I mean, it's not like yeah, I think done. you know there's a longer studio conversation about Vast anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, that like. Right now, I think where we're at in terms of the broader, so you can kind of guess our, our schedule for the next year. So here we are at the end of the year, mm -hmm. talking about next year, which mm -hmm. is going to see, you know, a Kickstarter in the first half of the year, uh, the, the release of a game that we're really excited about, Ahoy, yeah. in, in the middle of the year, and then potentially a release of uh, uh, a Kickstarter for another game at the end of the year, towards the end of the year. And then Marauder is also coming out and having a big retail release. At yeah, the start of the yeah, year. Marauder will release, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have like a very full year. Yeah, we are. and what what we're hoping to do, at least over the next like year year or so, is just kind of experiment with different things. Like, not we don't want to just buckle down and say like we're the root company or we're the whatever company. We want to kind of broaden out as much as we can broaden out, try new things, and then in the coming years we'll start kind of reassessing like, okay, which of these titles does it make sense for us to build more content for? Which of these titles should we Revisited on a bigger scale, right. things like that, and I think Vast gets wrapped in those. What did the Focal article say about us? It was, we're not the asymmetric company; we're the we're like the power dynamic. Yeah, the power dynamic. The company. Kind of power yeah, dynamic yeah, yeah, yeah. company is is what we're actually about. So, mm -hmm. Stellaris is real time. So, yeah, it's true. Sorry. Yeah, it's real time, but in like the wateriest of ways. Yeah, right? because you're always, I you're always real, I, um, time, yeah. I I remember when I first heard of Paradox and played uh, the very the, the second Europa Universalis game uh -huh. which in the like weird nerdy forums I hung out in in like my sophomore year of high school mm -hmm. everyone would say like oh Europa 2 that's the best game ever made mm -hmm. and they would just talk about it, the recession reports I was so excited so I finally got a copy and played it and it was so slow oh it's yeah it's so slow I thought oh it's a real time game I like real time games you mean like Warcraft yeah and it's so slow yeah. Uh, and I think Europe was excellent. I had to really, uh, I had to, I had to go to its pace. I couldn't bring, I couldn't bring it to mine. Um, uh, so politics and dark, uh, like I mentioned, I think what what I would like to do, I think where I would like to end up is if you have, if you are the highest score each turn, basically you pick up some form of attrition, some sort of drag on your society. So it's mm -hmm. it's like reverse of the birds. You're not gaining actions. You're you're losing. Potential and you're becoming mm -hmm. more unwieldy as you grow, until you are not the heads, you're not in the lead. That's that's just a good natural rubber banding, and uh, I think it'll add a lot to the story. Just be like, oh yeah, when your captain's deserts, and now you right. gotta, you now you got to live with. Now not only do you have to fight the other player, but there's this there's this rogue faction now that you have to deal with. So and mm -hmm. so on. So I mean, and Stellaris had some of that, but that's that's also gone away quite a bit. Um, when they're talking about that for their next expansion, is to have a little bit more about the internal politics. Um, someone asked about the Marauders PMP being updated. Uh, it will it will be updated. Or oh, actually, the Marauders PMP is almost the published game. Yeah. Uh, the only difference when I did a comparison of the boards, um, the boards they just got a little bit of polish in terms of the layout. I don't think any of the text is different. The icons are slightly behind, uh, so like they don't have the official final icons. Mm -hmm. We will be doing a uh, a TTS update at some point uh, for those. But it's it's probably gonna be after Christmas, just because uh, everyone's getting Ahoy ready right now. That that would be working on the updating of that kit, so it, it will happen. But um, but probably not soon. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, uh, are there faction powers and arcs? Not really. But uh, one of the again, like when I think about little design conceits for arcs, one of them is I wanted players to start in positions of complete symmetry or close to complete symmetry. And in the in the cycle in the arc, in positions as different as factions and vast, so that 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 whole breaking apart in the conflict and all that stuff happens over the course of the game. Uh, so players develop their own faction powers; they don't start with any baked in. Uh, what about Ahoy and TTS? Um, I don't know. That's up to marketing. <laughs> I mean, it is like you know, Ahoy and TTS is something that we could do. Uh -huh. uh, but we're kind of doing something a little different with the game's release, and so we, uh, that, that, that's up to other people who aren't me. Uh, okay. Um, that's pretty cool. I like that. Coconut tank. I'm going to go work on that. 
Uh, oh my god. <laughs> have we have we considered it? Kevin Lewis. Have we considered it? Um, oh. Oh, the stream is over. Um no, no, no comment. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. How many more route maps? Who knows? We, we don't know. We'll, we will start making a call in the middle of next year about what the future route looks like. Um, okay. I'm excited about Rot. What Actually, game are you excited about? Let's answer that. Ooh, this is a good question for the new year. <clears throat> um, what game am I excited about for the new year? Uh, My I, copy of Batman is going to arrive any day. That's the game you're excited about. Apparently. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, so, yeah, it's in this your stream. We even do best of list next stream. <laughs> next stream. If you want. Um, I'm excited for... Uh, I've been playing a lot of Nicaea by Annabelle Holland. Mm -hmm. And it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very smart. Uh, I am so, so, so excited to play it more. I am very excited to get my copy of Veiled Fate at mm -hmm. some point. Because I really enjoy that social deduction game mm, yeah, I'm good. excited yeah. to play the new Arkham Horror campaign which I just got the Edge of the Earth the Mountains of Madness campaign the one that takes place in Antarctica oh that's cool I'm pumped gonna do that soon I'm uh, gonna play more of uh, the ship one. Oh okay. yeah Unfathomable Unfathomable thank you <laughs> yeah you're good, you're good and then I am in, in non-board game spaces I am very excited about uh, I think I'm gonna play over winter break because we'll be out by the way from December 23rd-ish to the 1st or 2nd. Yep. We shut down the studio, have a little holiday break, um, and I and I think I'm going to do another run through Disco Elysium, which Elysium, which I did. I, I did before they put the voice acting in, and I kind of want to do it again. Um, and, and make some different choices. Uh, and so th those are the things that I'm I am I was so about. paralyzed by finally having a game where you could just go do anything that I, 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 I froze. It's like the the choices you make in that game have such consequence that it it straight freezes people because yeah there is this um are we allowed to curse on this stream I have no idea okay I'm gonna do it anyway right. uh, there there was uh, I've been thinking a lot about open world games lately because of that action button review uh, of of cyberpunk and there's this amazing article in the new inquiry called fuck forever and never die mm -hmm. which is about how Open world games are just these like goofy wax museums where they like kind of trick you into thinking that you can do everything. Yeah. And but actually, you're not making any choices because none of your choices have any real consequences. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because if your choice had consequences, it would mean that you would have less choice and for your future consequences. Right. Like, you get into this vicious cycle that results in like the weird amusement park that is the open world game. Yeah. Uh, it's a great piece. It's, it's about mostly Skyrim uh, because that was the game that was out right. uh, when, when it was published. Um, but Disco Elysium is not that. You make choices, yeah, they, they matter, have to live with it. And, yeah. and they close things off. And that has been a big influence in both Oath and in Arcs. Because in Oath, one of my favorite things is drawing three cards. Knowing that you you want all three, but you only get to keep one. And yeah. then also knowing that those other two cards are now in the mix. And other people are going to be grabbing them. Right. And with Arcs, the way the narrative branching works is that like you have to commit. You don't get to like hoard all the victory conditions and then pick at the last minute right. the one that's best you have to choose at you know a few different times over the course of the arc like what the direction you want to go in okay what games are you excited for i think that's what i liked about bully because at the end of the game you go it's summer vacation for the character and it's like everything's still kind of the same mm -hmm. but you feel like you're retired you know? oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like video it's like video game heaven uh oh gosh this got back to me i am ex i am excited to play batman but i don't think that's a good game to be excited about um <laughs> thank you drew for posting the link <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks drew <laughs> uh, um gosh i don't know i don't think i'm excited about anything right now people get me excited about stuff mm -hmm. i've been I've been bad about playing new stuff so yeah well you've got uh final girl which you're gonna keep exploring yeah yeah i've been enjoying that yep um, I like play the scenarios because the procedurally generated scenarios are a little bit too easy. No, no diss on the game. Yeah, um, but just, yeah. play the scenarios and the. Um, I liked it a lot. I like I said, I thought it was just a little bit too easy. Um, but I think if I come back to the scenarios in the book, um, it'll be it'll be better. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be, so I'll do that. 
yeah that's it cool well i hope everyone has a lovely end of their 2021 and we will see you in a month um for the january stream uh where we'll probably be talking a lot about arcs yeah and the february stream we'll be talking even more about it so i'm just going to be you know in, encroaching more and more in this space um and yeah that's that's kind of it for us uh yeah enjoy, if you're in a spot that's snowing enjoy it enjoy it while it's while it's so pretty and stay safe looks a little slick out there so yep. maybe I might, I might head home a little early tonight and of course if you have any questions or comments feel free to get us at twitter um we're at leader games and uh we also very active on the woodland warriors discord mm -hmm. so you can join that discord and and hang out with us and uh, play games and all sorts of stuff. We didn't talk about the winter tournament at all. Uh, I've been listening to some of the games. They've been lovely, uh, really terrible. exciting. Lots of, uh, I don't know, it's just love. Like, Root in a tournament setting is hilarious and wonderful, and I, I really adore it. Uh, Latrick Peter is doing very well. Really? In the term, no. Oh. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. Yes, it, it does have a hard mode, and I should try that. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's uh, it's really uh, it, it's really wonderful to, to have that out. I, I appreciate all the, all the work that Garrick and others uh, do for it. So, good work. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I think that's it for us. And, uh, yeah, have a wonderful end of the year. Yeah, thanks.